Well, hey, everybody, and good morning, and welcome to Church at Home. Uh, if we haven't met, my name is Burn, one of the pastors here. I just want to thank you for coming into my home this morning as we're uh, continuing our series called Hindsight is 2020, where what we've been doing for the last month is uh, looking at some lessons that we can glean from this really unique year that we had back in 2020. We've talked about how things aren't in our control. We've talked about gratitude. Last week, we did a, a stint on politics because, listen, we're, we're coming out of an election year, and... Um, it's also been, also been a year where, man, I feel like we've seen more division in our country than I, I've seen maybe in my lifetime. Uh, it's a really unique time to be alive. And so I just kind of, kind of go forward within that vein and talk about uh, some things I think are influencing a lot of us and, and creating some stuff in us that I don't think are good, I think came to a head uh, this year, but we're certainly very, very present in 2020 as well. So to do that, we're going to be in the, in the Gospel of Matthew today. We're going to start out Matthew chapter 6. Uh, while you're turning there, or if you're on our online campus, feel free just to hit that Bible tab and go to Matthew 6. Uh, what we're doing is we're, we're in this passage where it's part of this huge teaching of Jesus, one of those famous teachings of Jesus called the Sermon on the Mount, where basically what Jesus did was you know, he got people together on the side of a mountain, got up and started to talk. And some of the most famous teachings of Jesus are right there. So he talks about you know, like the golden rule, right? Like, you know, do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. And, you know, he talks about, like, blessed are the meek. And there's, all you know, like, the, the Lord's Prayer is there in the Sermon on the Mount. And in the middle of all that, there's this really interesting thing that he says in Matthew 6, starting in verse 19. I have it just some notes on my iPad here, so I'm, I'm going to read it with you. Here's what he says in Matthew 6, 19. He says, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal. In other words, what he's saying is, listen, don't make your life about what you can get in this life. Like, don't make your life about collecting and protecting the stuff that you can accrue for yourself here on the earth, because ultimately all the stuff that you can get here is going to fall apart. And so instead, what he says is this, verse 20, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where moths and vermin do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. He says, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. In other words, Jesus would say, listen, like the things that you make your life about is where your passions will go. And so listen, if you're working in your life to build a, an inheritance, a, a treasure in heaven, not for this life here, because we're just temporarily here, but instead a reward in heaven, then man, that's where your heart's going to go. Your heart's going to go to eternal things rather than temporary ones here in this life. And so with that in mind, he says this next thing, and it's just, it's Sometimes we, we hear this first, but we don't understand the context for it. So that's the context for this crucial statement that he says in verse 22. He says, the eye is the lamp of the body. Let me say that again. The eye is the lamp of the body. I mean, what's, he, what's he getting at here? Well, what he's talking about is this idea of your eye being, like when he talks about a lamp, he's talking about a source of light. In other words, he's saying like, you know, you know, think about if you're in a room, right? You got a window, okay? And and you got the the blinds open. What happens if it's a really sunny day? Well, well light pours into the room, right? Cuz that's the source of light. So light pours in. But but what happens if it's dark outside? Well, well no light comes in. In fact, the room becomes dark, right? Because because just like a source of light affects the entire mood, focus, atmosphere of the room. And he goes, that's what your eye does. Like what you set your eye to affects all of you. And so he says, the eye is the lamp of the body. Uh, if your eyes are healthy, your whole body would be full of light. But if your eyes are unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. He says, and if then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? In other words, what he's saying is simply this, your eye and what you set it to affects the house, which is your body. Your eye, the things that you choose to, to focus on, the things you choose to look at and like make the goals of your life, ultimately what that does is it affects all of you. And here's why I'm bringing this up, because it's just a simple principle. If you're taking notes, write this down. You become what you consume. Let me say that again. You become what you consume. Like what you focus on in life, what you make your life about, like, like with Jesus' idea of, okay, it's not about temporary things here on earth and it's not about setting your eyes to earthly things. Why? Because ultimately, like that source of light is affected. It's like you become what you 
consumed. Like what you make your life about affects not just part of you, but all of you. I mean, like with this idea of you becoming what you consume. I mean, like just think about it. Like this is just such a basic principle in life. Like right right now, like if we're if we're if we're being truthful, church, I'm rocking a dad bod. Okay, you know why I'm rocking rocking a dad bod? It's not because of my love of vegetables. No, no, it's because of my love of everything that aren't vegetables, chocolate, deep fried things. Like if I could, I would eat state fair food every day of my life and I'd be happy with it, okay? Like deep fried cookies, deep fried, or why not? Why not, okay? What happened? I become what I consume, okay? In the same way, it's in, it's in you do as well. It's in the same way when it comes to friendships, okay? You know, as, as my good buddy Mikey Coyle loves to say, if you hang out in a barbershop long enough, you're going to come out with a haircut. Like the people that we surround ourselves with influence our outlook and who we are as people. And you go like, how can you say that? Well, because the Bible teaches that. Proverbs 13, 20 says it like this. Walk with the wise and become wise. For a companion of fools suffers harm. Meaning, okay, like the people that you surround yourself with, the voices that you choose to listen to will, not might, will affect you. All the different things that come at you, why? Because the eyes, the lamp of the body, like walk with the wise, you become what you consume. It's the same with worldviews. There's a reason that populations in certain areas hold like political views. Right? That's why there's such things as red states and blue states, because people, they get around each other and like-minded mindsets win out, okay? And, and the reason that I want to bring this up today is because as we're coming out of the election season and we're going into a new uh, administration and all this political stuff, I, I just got to tell you this. As your pastor, I'm really concerned. I'm really concerned about what's coming out of us as a result of what's going into us. I'm really concerned about the way that like, we are like, just being inundated with information, particularly in two places, the news and news media and social media. I'm concerned about how we're being influenced by the stuff that we're consuming. And today, I want us to talk about this and exercise a little bit of wisdom when it comes to these two areas, news and social media. Because we become what we're consuming. And unfortunately, what a lot of us are consuming is not good for the cause of Christ. It's not good for our hearts. It's not good for our lives. And we need to check it a little bit better. So to illustrate this, as we let me just start out by talking about the news. Um, and I want to say it this way. So not too long ago, Oh, actually, it's been longer. I mean, time flies, guys. A little while back, uh, my wife and I were in the market for a new car. You know, our old car was dying, and, and so we had to go to an auto lot to find one. And when we got there on the lot, we met a very nice salesman. He was showing us different models. And during our interaction with him, he said this thing. I don't know if you've ever uh, car shopped and had a salesman saying so, something similar to you as well. He's talking to us about these things. And he goes, I just want to get you guys the best deal possible. That's what he said. Like, okay, like, you know, you're here shopping. Guys, I'm like, my goal today, I just want to get you the best deal possible. I mean, man, wow, wow, what a what a great guy. You know, like what he's all about. He just wants to get the best deal possible. But come on, how many of you know, like, like if, if you were at a place where somebody's trying to sell you something, would you take them at their word with that? Like, even even if you really like, even if he's, a, even if he's a great guy, even if like he he really does want to hook us up, would you like if you were at a place where you were going to buy something, would you just receive that type of statement unchecked? Be like, oh well, he just wants to get me the best deal, so whatever he says goes. I'll just trust that it's the best. No, you'd be foolish to do so, wouldn't you? Why? Because you realize that he's selling something. Yes, you realize that at the end of the day, what he wants is to sell you a product, and so it would be foolish for you to just take that unchecked even though you want to give them the benefit of the doubt. And you go, man, Bert, you're being cynical. I'm not being cynical, I'm being biblical. Look, Proverbs 14, 15 says it like this. The simple believe anything, but the prudent give thought to their steps. The simple, the foolish people, like they believe anything that comes their way. Somebody tells them something and it tickles their ears and they go, oh man, that sounds really good. They just believe it. But the prudent, people who want their lives to go a certain way, people who are wise, give thought to their steps. Again, Jesus says it like this in Matthew 10, 16. To his disciples, he says, I am sending you out like sheep among wolves. Therefore, be as shrewd as snakes and as innocent as doves. In other words, use some wisdom here, guys. Don't lose your righteousness, don't lose your purity, don't lose your holiness, but no, listen, when it comes down to it, 
think through what's coming at you because there are people who do not have your best interests in mind who are out to get something from you. And just like we would say with the car salesman, all right, hold up, pause for a second, buddy. Here's why I'm bringing this up. Because when it comes to news and information, you need to understand that many, many, many news outlets are making a sale as well. Then when it comes down to it, I'm not saying they're not genuine. I'm not saying that, okay, like, listen, there are people who are sincere, who just want to present information as they encounter it as much as possible. But you have to understand that there's so much going into that machine that's presenting you information. Like, you have to keep this in mind as you listen. So, for instance, TV news. TV news. Here's the sale, okay? TV news, in order to stay on the air, they have to uh, get ratings. They have to get people to watch their show. And so TV news outlets, particularly cable news, what they do is they lean certain political directions. And this will influence the way they report every single story because if, if they're recognized, for instance, let's say they're a conservative place. Okay, what they're going to try and do is present way the news in a way that's going to uh, draw the viewership of conservatives. In the same way, liberal news. What they're going to do is present information, the same information, but with a liberal leaning in order to draw liberals into watching. Watching it. This is what is called a target audience. What people are trying to do is get you to watch this because here's why they need ratings. They need ratings so that they get what are called sponsors. Because, okay, TV might be free for you and me, but it's not free for them to, to make it. And so they get sponsors, people who pay for their show to be on the air. Well, how do sponsors get there? Well, they want the largest audience that they can sell their product to. Because, listen, TV is a business. It's not just a resource. It's, it is absolutely a machine that is there to make money. You just need to know that's there. So it's why like, you, you know, you'll have a news show. And they'll be like, oh, man, my guest today is this author of this book. Well, why is that author there? Because, number one, the author might feed into to the message that they're trying to get out. Number two, they're trying to sell the book. Like a sale is trying to be made. They're trying to sell a brand. They're trying to sell a TV personality. It's why many, many news anchors are outspoken personalities. Why? Because the personality gets ratings. It's a sale. And so you'd be foolish to just take it unchecked just because you trust the network. That would be a mistake to do. In the same way, listen, when it comes to news websites, news websites are a business as well. They are trying to get clicks. They are trying to get people to click on their website because clicking on the website creates ad revenue. They can get uh, sponsors to pay for banners and on and on and on it goes. And in all of this, in all these machines as we're trying to be, you know, shrewd as serpents and innocent as doves, as we're trying to give thought to our steps, you have to understand that in all of it, there is a central tactic that is used again and again and again to get the ratings, to get the clicks, to get you to keep watching. Because how, here's the crazy part, right? Cable news is on 24-7, right? Even though the same inf amount of information is presented. And so they're constantly repeating the stories over and over and over again. But they're teasing them out. and they're Why? Because they want you to keep watching. And there's a central tactic. There's, there's something that they use to keep you watching. And it's this word right here. Fear. Fear. This is how it works, okay? Like when it comes down to it, they're going to use it, fear, whether that be fear in the terms of being taken advantage of or fear in the terms of resentment. What they're going to do is like, particularly if it's a political leaning and, and most, if not all news uh, outlets are, they're going to present things to you in a certain way. And it's going to something like this, okay? The people who disagree with us are uninformed and morally bankrupt. And so if you just, or, or here's the other part, they're going to present you as a victim, they're going to say, listen, man, like, like it used to be good for you, but if those other people have their way, my gosh, it's going to be terrible for you. It's going to be terrible for what you're, you value in life. And, and so, oh, man, like, what are they going to do to us? Like, if you're watching conservative, man, what are the liberals going to do if they're in power? If you're watching liberal, well, I mean, what are the conservatives going to do if they're in power? And you've seen this play out in your life. Think about, you know, back years ago when Barack Obama was elected president. How did it go? It went, man, once, if, if Obama, this secret Muslim, becomes president, we're, he's going to end Christianity in America. I just know it. Like this guy, he's going to take away the church. He's going to take away your guns. And guess what? Both remain. And then Trump came in. Remember? All right. And when Trump came in, like the left, they said, listen, okay, if Trump is elected, what's going to happen? Well, well, listen, if you're gay, he's going to take away gay marriage. Even though he didn't campaign on that. And it didn't happen. But what happened? Okay, let's just, here's the truth. Here's why this is spun so much. Here's why they use fear as a tactic to keep you watching, keep you clicking, keep on listening. Here's why. Really simple. Because fear sells. Fear sells. 
Fear gets ratings. Fear gets clicks. And the more, you should just know this, but like when it comes to news sites, the more sensational, the more polarizing, the more like conspiratory, the more clicks come in because you go, oh my gosh, is that happening? And that, and, then, and that leads me, by the way, to politics and how they're presented. Because yeah, fear sells. It gets clicks, it gets rating, but it also gets votes. Fear also gets votes. And if not in this election, the next one. I mean, think about it. When was the last time, I mean, we just came out of an election. When was the last time you saw a political ad where the person was running for office and they went, ladies and gentlemen, my opponent's a pretty decent guy. I mean, honestly, you know what? If you voted for him and not me, you'll be okay. I, just, I think I'm better for the job, but really, he's okay. No, it doesn't work like that at all. In fact, what happens? It's the exact opposite. Uh, listen, I can sum up for you every political ad you saw in this election season in, in one word. And here's what the word is. Right? Like, that's it, right? Listen, like, okay, like, you need to elect so and so because they're going to take your this, they're going to take your that, they're going to take your liberties, they're going to take your guns, they're going to take your religion, they're going to take your children, they're going to take your money, they're going to take your house. Like, if you don't get our guy, you are up a creek, the fire is going to rain down from heaven, the world is going to end. Why? Because fear sells. If you don't elect so and so, everything that you know is going to end because the wrong people will be in power and we can't have that. And what happens as a result? Even though, number one, remember what Jesus said? We don't live for this world, we live for the next one. Remember that? What happens in us as a result? This is why I'm bringing it up, okay? What comes out of us when we consume that? Is it godliness? Is it, are you like, I'm going to trust the Lord more? I'm going to give this over to God? I'm going to love my neighbor more? No, you resent your neighbor more. What comes out? Despair, worry, anger, hatred, resentment, contempt. You right? Like As you're consuming and taking all this in, what happens? Rather than looking at your neighbor and being like, man, I'm just going to choose to give them the benefit of the doubt. I'm going to love my liberal neighbor. I'm going to love my conservative neighbor. No, you dehumanize them. And you look down your nose at them, right? You're like, oh man, I can't look at what they do. Oh, man. And you're like, I just post a passive aggressive jab at them. Like, oh, oh, here go these snowflakes again. Oh, here go these, these cold hearted conservatives. I mean, just back and forth it goes. I'm bringing this up because none of it makes you more like God. As you're listening to this stuff, as you're consuming it more, none of it makes you trust him more. None of it encourages you to, to follow Jesus and hand your life over to him more. No, instead it teaches you to hold on to your life more, be angry if somebody's going to try and take some of it from you. None of it makes you love your neighbor with whom you disagree more. And none of it, none of it gives you peace. None of it makes you go, oh man, I just, I'm, I'm walking in God's will right now. And no, and the exact opposite happens. Fear sells. And it sells you all kinds of ungodliness. I'll give you a couple examples because here's how this is going to play out right now. All right, so Biden just took office, and you just you just watch. Here's how this is going to go if if the patterns continue. All right, it's going to be a week or two of celebrating. If, if you're watching like if, if you're watching liberal stuff, here's how it's going to go. Okay, a week or two of celebrating. And be like, oh man, we finally got our guy in the office. Isn't this great? Oh wow, like you know, here's here's Biden. Like, that's how the liberal stuff is going to go. And then after a couple of weeks, they're going to find a new target. And it's going to go something like this. Man, those Republicans are trying to stop Biden from doing the stuff he needs to do. Those Republicans, like it was great. Like, we've got our guy here, but now those Republicans are out to get us and we got to fight them. But if you're on the conservative end, what's going to happen? It's going to go like this. Well, first of all, it's, it's oh man, our guy lost. And then instantly fault fighting with everything that Biden does is going to come in. To the point where you're going to go, man, does this guy ever do anything right? What's happened? Well, it's, it's been spun to you. It's, it's the fear. And we, we dehumanize. That's why you'll be, you'll be watching, you know, <laughs> One America Network or, or Fox News. You'll be like, oh, man, that, that Nancy Pelosi, oh, like, if I had a bucket of water threw it on her, she'd probably melt. I just know it. Like, what is that? What is that? <laughs> Here's what it is. It's that the fruit of fear is the opposite of godliness. And if you don't believe me, here's what the scriptures say. 1 John 4, 18, there is no fear in love. None. There's no fear in love. But perfect love drives out fear. Think about it. It drives out. Like Jesus in the, in the temple where he clears out these money changers and he clears out. And it's like driving stuff out. And John goes, that's what love does to fear. 
(laughs) Perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. In other words, as we're holding on to this, I need to hold on to this, I gotta protect that. Again, go back to the beginning. Remember, we're not living for here. But number two, in living that way, we're going contrary to the nature of God. And this is just amped up. All these outlets are doing is they're just preying on insecurities and fears and all kinds of desperations and sentiment. I mean, like, they're just preying on it to keep you buying their product which is ratings, which is clicks. But we've got a bigger problem now because it used to just be there. But now there's this other means through which we're getting corrupted and we're, we're being influenced and what we're consuming is messing with us. And it's this other avenue here, social media. Social media, because here's what's happening. The rift is getting bigger. I'll give you some examples. So first, um, this past year, there's a, there a great little documentary that came out. Maybe you saw it's called The Social Dilemma where one of the things that they did was they, uh, they interviewed a bunch of uh, higher-ups with, with big tech companies from Google, Facebook, Pinterest, um, Twitter, like all, all kinds of them. And they talk about, man, how are we being influenced by social media? And one of the things that kept coming back over and over again was this idea of, okay, social media operates on what's called an algorithm. That basically, it learns your behavior by how you use it. And so the longer you use it, it becomes more catered to you because they want to keep you clicking on and using this. I don't know anybody that questions this, right? So for instance, if you begin to express conservative political leanings, what's going to happen is uh, the liberal stuff is going to be filtered out more and more. And what's going to happen is that, like, let's say you're more prone to conspiracy or sensational stories. That's what's going to begin to flood your feed more, all right? In the same way, okay, let's say you're, you're, you're liberal, okay, and what, what, what's going to happen? Okay, well, conservative stuff is going to be filtered out more and more, and the more sensational liberal stuff is going to be filtering into your feed more and more. And so ultimately what happens is the voices that you hear mostly are those that already dis- or the, are the ones that already agree with you. And those with whom you disagree become demonized and dehumanized. Okay, now here's, here's why this is a problem because it robs those with whom we disagree of their humanity. And we begin to view them not as sincere, but morally bankrupt and uninformed. Give you an example. So my father, um, my dad's right now, my dad is enjoying retirement. And, uh, you know, he's been traveling a lot a little while back, not maybe a month or two ago. Uh, He took a trip down to South Carolina, as he he does very often, and stays at a very particular hotel over and over again. And he's there enough that he gets to know other people who are retirees who stay there as well. And there's this one guy he's known for years who dad, uh, you know, has always seen as pretty intelligent and smart. And they were talking about the election and, and all this stuff. And as the guy's sort of going on, he begins to vocalize, like, political views that my dad just completely disagreed with. And so my dad's listening to him, and internally, dad just goes, man, like, I thought so much higher of you. Like, you cannot be this stupid to think this. And as he's thinking this, the guy, other side, just vocalizes, Bruce, you can't be this, this stupid as to disagree with this. And my dad just goes, well, what? What happened? Well, here's what happens. We are being given different information. And the information that we're consuming appeals to what we call confirmation bias. Meaning, like, you might get the same news story, but you're presented it in a completely different way, or stuff is just omitted altogether. So no, we're not getting the same information. Instead, we are given stuff that just feeds into our own already leanings and already fears and already uh, eccentricities. And so opinions are, are f- like, filtered. This is how social media works. But now, see, social media makes it worse. And here's why. Because now instead of just viewing the news through social media, we become the news. Now in social media, instead of just watching it, we distribute the information. And so now there's this whole level of self, like like in terms of personal worth, self-image being fed into that. And so what happens is this, like, come on, why do we post anything? We want somebody to think something about it, right? So like, okay, I I post a, a view because, you know, I want people to think that I'm smart. Or I want people to think that I'm woke. Or I want people to think that I'm compassionate. Or I want people to think that, I, I, like, that I, I'm informed. Or I want people to see this part of my life. Like social media just feeds on insecurity. Okay, well now what, like when you begin to post social stuff, well now your personal self-worth is invested in news stories that you may have backed down on before if you were confronted on them. 
Like in terms of their validity, in terms of their truth. But now because you're posting it, you're, you're self-involved in it. So you've got to double down on things that aren't actually that important. But you do it. Why? Because your self-image is involved in it. See, this is where it's different from just watching TV. Now you are the broadcaster. And now you've got to back up what you're saying. And so we become more like divided because it's not just me disagreeing. It's me forming opinions to get people to like me. And to get people who maybe disagree with me, well, I've got to fight them harder. Like it's not just consuming information. It's not us distributing it. And here's what Paul says about that. You're like, where's the Bible? Right here. Galatians 1.10. Paul writes, am I now trying to win the approval of human beings? Or of God? Or am I trying to please people? If I were still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. And for many of you, this is what your life's about. This is why you're going so rogue. Because your life isn't about Christ. It's about getting people to like you. And just amping up your social feeds. You get caught up in all kinds of these things. And this is what's happening right now, guys. We're just consuming all this stuff. We're distributing all this stuff. And we're giving no thought to it because we just assume we are so well informed. And I'm telling you, we got to use more wisdom than that. Because the rift is growing bigger and bigger. We're becoming less and less like Jesus. We go, well, how do we fix it? How do we fix it? A few years ago, author Brene Brown released a book called Braving the Wilderness where she studied this very idea in detail about how we're becoming divided and polarized as a people. And she gave several applications for reversing the tide. I'm just going to give you one. Real simple. She just said it like this. People are hard to hate close up. People are hard to hate close up. If you want to know how you, be, you begin to reverse the tide, you form your opinions based on actual in-person experiences. Not online ones. Not news headers. Not clickbait. Instead of being like, like you know, so for instance, let's say you're you're liberal, right? And you're like, oh man, those conservatives are just out to get me. But then you go, oh, but you know what? There is my grandma who's conservative, who just loves me to pieces. And she and I, we disagree a lot, but I know that at the end of the day, she really wants what's best for me. Okay, if you're conservative, you go, oh, those liberals, they just, they, man, they're just so, such snowflakes and they're so like morally, like they're, they're just like lackadaisical. And you go, okay, but... You know, there, there, there's my friend John, and you know what? Like he, at the end of the day, like the reason that he supports the stuff that he does is because he, he really is concerned about certain people being cared for. And it's not just him about furthering an agenda. Like he, like I know he loves well. And we may disagree about the finer points of morality, and we may disagree about what's ultimately good or bad, but what we do is we form our opinions not based on news headlines. We base them on people that we know, people that we know love us, people that we love. Assume, here's a crazy idea. What would happen if you believed, if you just gave those with whom you disagree the benefit of the doubt that maybe they are as informed as you are, they've just been given different information? And what would happen if they did the same for you? That you, you, you didn't write them off as irrational or uninformed, but instead say, you know what? I'm going to choose to believe the best about them. Okay, they really care, but the reason they care isn't selfish. The reason they care isn't bigoted. The reason that they care isn't because they, they, they're, they, they're falling apart. Like, no, the reason they care, they have some really good reasons. And I may disagree with those reasons. I may think that those reasons don't hold salt, but I know why they do it. Here's what's going to happen. You're going to love them well. And the reason that you'll love them well is because you see them not as an obstacle to overcome, but a person to be loved. And that's the whole world of difference right there. And, and you're like, man, or, you know, of course you say that because, you know, what, like you're, you're, you're a millennial or you're this or you're that. I would just tell you this is a very distinctly American idea. You know how I know that? Hey, my conservative friends, there was a great president years ago. His name was George H.W. Bush. You may have heard of him. George H.W. Bush, he lived by this policy. He said, listen, just because you run against someone does not mean you have to be enemies. Politics does not have to be mean and ugly. And those who know him who, or knew him could testify that he lived this out to the point where even when he lost the biggest political campaign of his life against uh, then governor of Arkansas, Bill Clinton, and it came to the peaceful transition of power. George H.W. Bush famously left a note for Clinton in the Oval Office after he left. The guy that had, had I mean, that he worked so hard against. And here's what he said in this note. And if you haven't heard of this, just 
I just find this refreshing. He said, Dear Bill, when I walked into this office just now, I felt the same sense of wonder and respect that I felt for I felt four years ago. I know you'll feel that too. I wish you great happiness here. I have never felt the loneliness some presidents have described. There'll be very difficult times, made even more difficult by the criticism you may not think is fair. I'm not a very good one to give advice, but just don't let the critics discourage you or push you off course. Now listen to this, the guy who lost to him. You will be our president when you read this note. I wish you well. I wish your family well. Your success is now our country's success. I'm rooting hard for you. Good luck, George. How do you say something like that in this day and age? That sentiment comes from one that's gone by, but we could have it again. I mean, could you imagine what would happen in this country if we said, you know what? Okay, race is over and next time we'll try, but I'm not gonna fight dirty. And okay, as, as a Jesus follower, there are gonna be times where I don't think, like, like the country, it goes away that I don't think that it should, but you know what? My hope was never in how this country went. It was in the kingdom of God. I'm not storing up for myself like treasures on earth. I'm storing up for myself treasures in heaven. And okay, you know what? There are gonna be times where it just seems like people who don't know Jesus act like people who don't know Jesus. But what I'm not going to do is I'm not going to rob them of their humanity. I'm going to choose to believe that God loves them as much as he loves me. And in everything that I do and all the voices that are going to come at me, I'm going to choose to filter those voices. And I'm going to gauge what their effect is, not by how much I watch it, but instead by observing what comes out of me as a result of watching it. I'm going to pay attention. Like, what would happen if we say, hold on. Man, you know, I'm getting a little bit angrier this other side. Or I'm getting a little bit bitter here. I'm, I'm losing my peace. I'm freaking out. I'm worried. Okay, let me just check where I'm getting that from. Because I know it doesn't come from Christ. What would happen if we as a people, rather than just buying in into, into different outlets, unchecked, chosen, you know what? At the end of the day, the important thing is not my agenda being passed, but how well I love my neighbor. What would we be if we did that? Right now, we're coming out of a time where, guys, I'm just going to be honest with you, I don't think we've done that well. But we could. And where it all starts, ultimately, isn't with a resolution. Because this is a heart issue. So it starts by us together seeking our great and glorious God. And so this morning, I want to wrap up by doing that. Let's just ask the Lord to trust Him more and to love others well. Just pray with me. Heavenly Father, I thank you because you care about me. You care about what's happening in me as a result of the things that I consume. And you care about how I love my neighbor. And so Lord, in this moment, number one, I'm gonna live for not this life, but the one to come. And so I'm gonna choose to trust you. I'm gonna make that what my life is about. And number two, Lord, I ask you, let me love those around me well. Let me love those with whom I disagree politically very well. Let me love those with whom I disagree religiously, morally well. Let me choose not to gossip on them. Let me choose not to uh, treat them as anything less than a human being made in the full image of God, just as I am. Loved just as much as I am. And Father, let me love them like you love them. I choose now to lay down my hostilities and treat the world as Christ has treated me. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Well, church fam, uh, thank you so much for tuning in this morning. Uh, we'll see you next week for more Church at Home. Bless you and have a great week.